This episode of Gun Blog Variety Cast brought to you by LawOfSelfDefense.com. Go to LawOfSelfDefense.com forward slash variety to learn about your state's self-defense laws. Sign up for one of their online or in-person seminars or buy the book Law of Self-Defense and get 10% off when you use the discount code variety at checkout. That's LawOfSelfDefense.com forward slash variety. Sit back, relax, and take a ride with us on the Gunblog Variety Cast, episode 87. Welcome back to the Gunblog Variety Cast. I'm Sean, and I'm joined as always by Adam. How are you doing, Adam? <sighs> I haven't slept in a year because of my children. Ah, that's right. It's not Adam this week at all. It's Aaron because Adam is having eye surgery, I think it is. I think he's probably already done with his eye surgery and he's doped up on some kind of chemicals and laying in bed. Tripping out on the good stuff. Yeah, I hope so. Well, let's jump straight into it. The Tactical Dog and Fitness Report. I walked a total of 3.74 dog walking miles this week because I spent the entire week in a hotel in Tampa at a work conference. Yay. For any listeners in Tampa, I'm sorry I didn't say anything about it beforehand so that we could do like a meetup or something, but I really didn't have any time. And there's that whole security thing, right? Yeah, there is that. So what about you, Aaron? Do you walk your dogs? Yeah, I I walk my dogs every day. And uh, the biggest thing that I've accomplished recently is I have almost entirely cut sodas out of my diet. Oh, okay. So you're going down the Adam path, no sodas? It's more like I need to lose weight, but I'm lazy. And so it's easier to stop consuming something than it is to actually burn the calories off. (laughs) Yeah, it's probably true. I stopped drinking soda, but it was because the medicine that the doctor gave me made everything that was carbonated taste really bad. Mm. And now it's time for blue collar prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Erin Paulette. This week, Erin concludes her thinking about how we think series with the answer to the question, why do our brains make us do dumb things? Let me see here. Um... It's not pre-recorded, Aaron. What do I do? Screw it. We'll do it live. Oh, well, all right. I guess we could. Come on, every pony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Aaron Paulette. Aaron, this entire series has been about overcoming ways our brains sabotage us. Why can't we just not do dumb things? That's a great question. Uh, The simple answer is that in the conditions I've talked about, mental models, behavioral scripts, groupness, our bodies reward us for taking these actions. When you stop to think about it, our bodies are basically drug pushers trying to get our brains high with chemicals. There's a joke that dopamine and serotonin are technically the only two things you enjoy. Serotonin is what gives feelings of contentment, relaxation, and happiness, while dopamine deals with pleasurable excitement such as eating food, playing games, or having sex. As an aside, there's another happiness chemical called oxytocin, which is responsible for feelings of trust and belonging. This allows us to form groups and work together, but oxytocin takes longer to build up than serotonin and dopamine. So, if we perform an action correctly and efficiently, we go about our day that much faster, and we don't have to deal with the stress and irritation of having done it wrong, which would decrease our serotonin levels. So we are rewarded by doing it correctly. And when we do it correctly, we feel that burst of elation, dopamine, from our accomplishment. Now, obviously, this is all greatly simplified, but you get the idea that the body essentially rewards the brain for good behavior with dopamine and punishes it for ineffective behavior by withholding serotonin. This is why people do foolish things. When they perform these actions, they literally aren't thinking. They are being driven by a desire for a feel-good chemical, which is why the decisions seem like a good idea at the time, because we have been rewarded throughout history with a good feeling when we do something that helps the organism. As an example, in his book Deep Survival, Lawrence Gonzalez talks about night carrier landings on the USS Carl Vinson. In one instance, a pilot was coming in too low, and the landing signal officer was giving him the wave-off command. 
But despite the large red light saying, do not land, and radio commands in his ears saying the same thing, and the fact that the pilot only had to move his throttle a little bit in order to try again, he didn't. He was so focused on the landing that instead, the tail of the plane hit the deck of the carrier and split the plane in half, killing his co-pilot. And of course, this raises the question, why did he do it? What was he thinking? And again, the answer is that he wasn't consciously thinking at all. He was feeling. Pilots will tell you that the hardest part of flying is the landing. It's a scary thing. And after every successful landing, that pilot received a dopamine rush for having put the plane safely on the ground. Therefore, for this pilot, the ground became equated to not only safety, but a chemical reward. And so the pilot fixated upon the goal of make it to the ground instead of concentrating on flying safely. And he did make it to the ground. He lived, but his co-pilot, and likely his career as a pilot, died. So when people have the, hey y'all, watch this moment that ends in disaster, it's because they're chasing that good feeling in their brain? Yes. The brain is wired to believe that things which feel good are beneficial to the body. And for a large part, that is true. Eating feels good because it keeps the organism alive. Sex feels good because it keeps the species alive, and so on. But these good feelings are easily abused, as is made plain by the millions of people who overeat, or engage in risky behavior for the rush, or are addicted to substances or harmful behavior. So how does knowing this affect a prepper's behavior? Well, in the same way that someone who is angry or in love can realize that her emotional state is clouding her judgment, a prepper needs to realize that our brains are clouded with reward chemicals that drive our actions. So, just as a person should take a deep breath and take a psychological step back before saying something in the heat of the moment, so too should a prepper ask herself, why do I want to perform this action? Is it truly necessary for survival? Or am I just chasing that good feeling? After a disaster, humans will be looking for ways to take their minds off the situation and brighten their moods. While such a lift is psychologically necessary, during or after disaster is precisely the wrong time to take such risks, because the possibility of injury is increased. And if you get in trouble, help may be late in coming if it arrives at all. So, as difficult as it sounds, in the aftermath of a disaster, you're going to need to strongly consider your actions before you perform them. In other words, make sure you truly did think about them rather than going off without thinking. All right, Aaron. It was good to talk to you, and I'd like to say I'll see you next week, but honestly, you're not really going anywhere, right? Not for a while, no. If you'd like to read more from me, check out my blog, lurkingrhythmically.blogspot.com. And what if we want to read more about prepping, just prepping and not just your personal blog? Well, then you would go to bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. Felons behaving badly. Man charged with murder after shooting alleged assailant armed with pipe. Well, there you go. That's self-defense. You'd think, right? Yeah. Had a pipe. Came right at him. A North Carolina father shot and killed a man who came at him with a metal pipe during an altercation Monday evening. And while the shooter claims he acted in self-defense, he is now facing murder charges. Suspect was in the driveway of his Alexander County home when he fired the fatal shot that killed victim. According to Suspect's account, victim and two other individuals came to his house after calling him on the phone and threatening to kill him. But victim's family members said the men went to Suspect's home to tell him to stay away from victim's nephew, who worked for Suspect, because Suspect was a bad influence on him. But Suspect said when the trio arrived, he walked outside, only to realize they were armed with metal pipes. Okay, so he receives a phone call that someone's going to kill him, and instead of calling the police, he goes outside when they show up? Suspect said victim charged at him right before he pulled the trigger. A neighbor told reporters he heard a single gunshot, but authorities have not confirmed if that count is accurate. Immediately after the shooting, the two individuals with victim quickly got him into their vehicle and called 911. They attempted to drive him to the hospital, but victim died about five miles from suspect's property. Suspect was subsequently charged with first-degree murder and is currently being held without bond. Why? Because he shot somebody. Who was coming at him with a pipe? On his own property. Yeah. In a castle state. Uh-huh. In a stand-your-ground state. What am I missing? 
Suspect said he thought he had a right to defend himself and his property. And his provisional attorney, Lisa Dubbs, said this is a case that may fall into the state's castle doctrine laws, which protect those who use deadly force against another person while fearing for his life or her life on their property. But Assistant District Attorney Sarah Kirkman argued that the statute didn't apply in this case. Additionally, Alexander County Sheriff Chris Bowman stressed that authorities are still early into the investigation, but noted when the shooting occurred that there was some distance between the two parties. In fact, the incident was captured on cell phone video and shows them about 50 feet apart when the shot was fired. Still, suspect said, when do you make that decision? When a man is coming towards you with a weapon, and when you have one shot, and there's three men with a weapon. A request to change suspect bond status was denied, despite the fact Dubs argued he had a nine-year-old daughter and is not a flight risk. If convicted, suspect could face up to life in prison. He is due back in court for a probable cause hearing next month. Now, hang on. You just said that the suspect said he had one shot. Why did he have only one shot? Well, it hasn't been reported reliably yet, but the word on the street is that it was a black powder rifle. Okay. Interesting choice. Yes, there seems to be a very good reason that it was a black powder rifle. Is it because it's not legally a firearm? In fact, there's a very good reason why he would have a black powder rifle because in his past, he has been convicted of five counts, damage to property, misdemeanor class one, drug paraphernalia, use possessed, misdemeanor class one, larceny, misdemeanor class one, possessed schedule six, misdemeanor class one, Violation of a protective order, misdemeanor class A1, possessed schedule 2, felon class I, speed to elude arrest, felon class H, hit and run, felon class H. So this suspect is the person that the victim said was a bad influence on the nephew. I can see that. There's one problem with that. The victim, on the other hand, possessed purchased wine beverage by someone under the age of 21, misdemeanor class 3, larceny attempted, misdemeanor class 2, Operate vehicle without a license, misdemeanor class 2. Two counts resisting officer, misdemeanor class 2. Breaking and entering paper currency machine, misdemeanor class 1. Five counts, common law forgery, misdemeanor class 1. Communicating threats attempted, misdemeanor class 1. Driver's license revoked, misdemeanor class 1. Drunken disorderly attempted, misdemeanor class 1. And as an aside, I'm not entirely certain how one attempts to be drunk and disorderly and fails. <laughs> <laughs> right? I can I can see succeeding in being drunk and disorderly, but I can't see attempting it. Just a low achiever. Yeah, seriously. Hit and run, misdemeanor class one. Three counts larceny, misdemeanor class one. Misdemeanor breaking and entering, misdemeanor class one. Operating a vehicle without a license attempted, misdemeanor class one. Three counts possess purchased malt beverage by someone under the age of 21, misdemeanor class one. Six counts felony breaking and entering, felon class H. Larceny after breaking and entering, felon class H. Four counts of larceny, over a thousand, felon class H. Pots. Kettles. Discussions of relative albedo levels. Yeah. A quick check of Facebook, which is always interesting, shows that the sort of people we're dealing with here have a rudimentary grasp of spelling. And uh, their friends also apparently have a rudimentary grasp of spelling. And one of the more interesting things is that someone claiming to be the victim's sister says that the suspect, when the victim showed up at his house with the pipe, went back into the house, grabbed the muzzle loader, came back out, and shot the victim. Yeah, that's not good. I don't know what state you live in, but in North Carolina? That's not self-defense. No, it's not in Florida either, according to Andrew Branca's Law of Self-Defense. Nope. No, it's not. That's pretty much the definition of, like, at least second-degree murder. And you know what? That may as well be first-degree murder. I can totally understand why they would charge somebody with first-degree murder. If somebody threatens you, comes over to your house, and you go outside, you see, oh, they've got a weapon. You go back into your house, you get a weapon with which to shoot them, and then you kill them with it. This is not self-defense. Yeah, not if you leave the house. Right. Now, you lock the door, you bunker down behind it with a weapon, they kick the door in, and you shoot them as they come through it. Yeah, that's castle right there. If you say to yourself, self, I only have one round, and you shoot them as they approach, that's okay too. But go back outside and take the shot? 
Mm-hmm. No, I'm not seeing it. No. Nope. National security threats come from the strangest places. In our Foreign Policy for Grown-Ups segment this week, Nikki tells us about the threat of Panama. Panama? Nikki, I recently saw a story about how a leak of confidential documents revealed how the rich and powerful use tax havens to hide their wealth. Do I sound like a total, like, Bernie Sanders supporter at this point? Yes, you do. <laughs> Panama was a particular subject of that leak. The United States considers illicit finance havens as a threat to U.S. national security. So is Panama really a threat? There's no doubt that Panama is an illicit finance hub. Until very recently, Panama was placed on this international money laundering watch list and was only removed in February after its government took steps to fix some serious issues with the country's banking and anti-money laundering counter-threat finance laws. We call them AMLCFT for short. Until this happened, Panama was placed on this gray list by the Financial Action Task Force, an international AMLCFT body that forced other nations to tell their banks to make additional checks on Panama-linked transactions. Being on the gray list impacts international trade and banking and threatens correspondent relationships with foreign banks. After all, who wants to do business with a haven for dirty money, right? Okay, but why is this a security threat for us? Well, money laundering is a necessary consequence of almost all profit-generating crimes and can occur almost anywhere in the world. So anytime a crime is committed by an international criminal organization or a terrorist act is committed by a terror organization, it requires financing. Money laundering helps obscure where the money comes from, whether it's money that comes from drug, human, or weapons trafficking, or money used to fund terrorist activity, or corrupt state assets that are stolen from the people of a certain nation. Certain countries make it easier to hide said money. So A, we don't want that dirty money touching the U.S. financial system, and B, at the same time, we certainly don't want the U.S. financial system to be a part of a network that helps hide dirty funds and facilitate terrorist or criminal activity. So Panama. Why is Panama bad? Is Panama a threat? Panama is not a direct threat to the United States per se. But all kinds of corrupt government officials, transnational organized criminals, drug traffickers, thieves, and terrorists use Panama to hide and store wealth including sanctioned individuals. Why use sanctions programs to cut illicit actors off from the U.S. financial system if they're just going to use Panama to store their money and then access the U.S. financial system anyway through correspondent accounts? Kind of negates the whole point of having sanctions programs to begin with, right? The documents recently leaked from the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca reveal that this company had links to at least 72 current or former heads of state, including dictators accused of looting their own countries. The company helped all sorts of illicit actors launder money, evade sanctions, and evade taxes. Taxes we don't care about, but a whole lot of other stuff we do. Panama is also a haven for shell company formation that helps illicit actors store and transfer wealth. Shell companies don't have active business operations and are basically used to just kind of store money, evade taxes, move it around, etc. Some countries like Panama are fairly easy jurisdictions to form these companies in a way where you will never find out the name of a beneficial owner. So it's pretty easy to move without having the name of a known criminal or sanctioned individual on the account. And what the documents revealed was shell companies with links to such actors as Egypt's Hosni Mubarak, the late Muammar Gaddafi, and Syria's Bashar al-Assad and their families. So Panama did take some steps to get itself removed from the fat of gray list. That said, I think it was basically the bare minimum because being gray listed does harm its economy and financial system, but the risks remain. It's still pretty easy to form shell companies in Panama, Someone can choose to register the company as either a person associated with an identity document or a legal entity, like a corporation that's identified through its registration with Panama's taxpayer registry. Corporations also register as something called anonymous societies that basically protects their confidentiality and at the same time prevents any financial institution trying to do its due diligence in identifying its customers and making sure illicit proceeds don't transact through them from doing so. 
Further, the founders of an anonymous society are required to sign documents identifying themselves as such before a Panamanian notary. Law firms there for a fee can sign the required paperwork before a notary in their place. So all of this further conceals the identities of the company's owners. Imagine a company owned by this anonymous entity that paid some law firm to sign ownership documents to create a company makes it nearly impossible for a bank or any other financial institution to do its due diligence in following Know Your Customer requirements. The Panamanian government made some strides, making registration of shipping companies more transparent, abiding by FATF AML CFT regulations, strengthening oversight of shareholders, all that kind of stuff. But we'll see if these changes make it any less attractive for money launderers, corrupt government actors, drug traffickers, and other unsavory characters to operate. FATF in October said there was still work to be done. It pointed in particular to reform needed to the framework for freezing terrorist assets, customer due diligence, and making sure Panama's financial intelligence unit was fully operational and effective. Panama's reputation clearly precedes any changes, so real change will probably take a while. But the biggest thing is the terrorists using jurisdictions such as Panama to move money and finance terrorist activities. And that definitely impacts our national security. All right, Nikki, it was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. You bet. Take care. Nikki blogs at the Liberty Zone. Dot com. Plug of the week. All right, Aaron, I'm blaming you for this one. <laughs> How so? Well, I believe it was you at some point said, hey, you know what? You totally need to get one of these phone charger battery pack thingies. Absolutely. And I think you actually recommended at some point that I pick up a power bank, an into circuit power bank. Sounds right. 11,200 milliamps, I think they are. I can't remember exactly how you read that. I ended up putting something like that on my, like, Amazon wish list and got it for Christmas a couple years ago. And I like it. I, you know, use it once in a great while. And then somebody else found this gigantic freaking, oh my God, what were they thinking battery? It was the Anchor Astro E7. And it was a 26,800, I think, I really think that's milliamp. I'm not really certain what the, but it's whatever they are rated in. It's 26,800 of them. Mm-hmm. I often wondered, is that a lot? <laughs> yes. Yes, in fact, it's a huge amount. Now, this is a $50 battery pack, basically. Well, I finally read the instructions on this thing. I've been carrying the thing around in my car. I, for a while, I kept it in the house because, you know, in case I, you know, we lost power and I needed to charge my phone or something. And then I thought, well, you know, I, I carried the little, you know, power bank in the car. Oh, well, I'll put the other one in the car because if I'm stuck at home, my car is at home too. So I can just go out to the car and get it if I need it. But if I'm not at home, I'm in my car, right? Right. So I go to Tampa and I take, I actually took both of these battery packs with me because I've been to these conferences before. They never have plugs at the tables we're sitting at. So I'm like, I'm bringing me my external battery. You know, I'm going to be set. Well, I finally read the instructions on this thing. And it says <laughs> you should discharge it once every four months. I'm like, ooh, um, you know, I haven't done that. Maybe I should do that. Well, I did this on Tuesday. I've been trying to use up all of the battery power in this Anchor E7 since Tuesday. How much is left? It's Friday night. It's currently charging my iPhone and my Kindle on the floor, and it's still not out. All day today, rather than manually like keep hitting the iPhone to keep the screen on to waste battery power on the iPhone, I turned on Google Maps, which actually forces the screen to stay on because, <laughs> you know, the screens would eat battery power, right? Right. <laughs> so that's how I wasted battery power because I had to waste battery power so that I could actually drain the battery because <laughs> I got to drain this thing and it's not working. I still have one light left. I don't know how long this thing's going to last. It says that an iPhone 6, not a 6 plus, but a 6, you can charge an iPhone 6 10 times with it. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you should hook it up to your TV. I'm wondering what you, what else you can do with it. It says you can charge an iPhone 6 10 times, a 6 plus or a Galaxy S6 six times, or you can charge an iPad Air twice. 
it's not light. I mean, I wouldn't pack it in my pants pocket. You mean it's almost like it's made out of lead? Uh, it was not that heavy. But I will tell you, I wear cargo pants. I think we've covered this in another plug of the week. I took the iPhone and stuck that in the little tech pocket. And I took this battery pack and I stuck it in the actual cargo pocket itself and had the cable running from one to the other. And I walked through the airport like that, you know, walked from where I was to where I needed to be and didn't have any problem with it. It wasn't like it was, you know, weighing my leg down any. I was, you know, it's it's not that bad. Okay. But I was charging my iPhone and I was charging my Kindle with the thing and still haven't run it out of battery. Awesome. The biggest problem you're going to have with it is every four months you're going to need to figure out how to drain it. And I think what I'm probably going to end up doing is buying myself a USB powered fan and every four months plugging <laughs> the USB powered fan into it and probably letting that run for a week. I don't know. I have no idea how long that fan would run. <laughs> probably quite a while. I Yeah, I I don't know. But I'm telling you, this is the way to go. Get yourself one of these things. If you travel, wow, you can go an entire week with this thing. I, I literally have not plugged my iPhone into a wall since Monday night. You know, I woke up Tuesday morning and since Tuesday morning, this thing has not been plugged into any external power source, but this battery. And I have been deliberately trying to burn through as much battery power as possible with this thing. And I still can't burn this battery out. So this is the way to go. It takes, I believe, about eight hours to charge it up fully. But you can do that overnight. 50 bucks, it's 50 bucks well spent, I think. So, I'm, and I'm blaming you. You got me started down this crazy path. You're welcome, Sean. Yeah. Oh, and it's got three charger ports. So you can charge three things at the same time. If you and, say, a significant other or someplace, you can both charge your phones. Oh, you can romantically charge from the same battery, Lady in the Tramp style. So check it out. It's in the show notes. It's the Anchor E7. It's $50 on Amazon. Prime shipping. So have you written off all those anti-gunners in your life? Beth Alcazar says you shouldn't. Maybe you should listen to her. Hey, Sean, this week, I really wanted to kind of share something and maybe get it off my chest a little bit. Maybe admit to the audience something in my own experiences in hopes that they can use that in their own lives to make a difference. You see, I kind of had a 180 degree change. And I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I didn't always like hunting or have an affinity for firearms. So there, I said it. And I know that a lot of us are dealing with people in our own lives, whether it be friends or family members. These are folks that also don't really care for hunting or guns, and maybe they actually take a stand against those things. Hopefully this story can maybe put some light on the issue and allow people to have some hope that there could be a chance for some change of heart. But let me tell you a little bit of background. We didn't have guns in our home, so I did not grow up with a house that had firearms. And I didn't grow up in an outdoors-loving family either. I know that my mother said that she'd shot a rifle once, so that didn't translate over to me as a must-do activity. And my father didn't take me hunting, fishing, camping, or shooting. Of course, my dad's from Brooklyn, and his idea of an outdoorsy thing to do in New York was to catch a Brooklyn Dodgers game. But thinking back, all of this is likely a big part of what skewed my perception of most shooting and outdoor activities. In fact, throughout much of my teen years, I may as well have been an anti-hunting activist, and that might not be the exact words I want to use. It sounds terrible, and even though I avoided people for the ethical treatment of animals, I was a member of the World Wildlife Fund and the Humane Society of the United States. And not really knowing this, but with my small amount of support money that I sent to these organizations for all those years, I was basically helping them stand against hunting and fishing, and possibly against some of our most basic rights and freedoms. But I had a big change of heart, and I wanted to share a little bit about that with all of you so you can see things from the other side, and so you perhaps can have hope that some people can do a 180 degree change now and then. It kind of started really with what feels like another lifetime ago when I accepted an apprenticeship position with a distinguished outdoor writer. I took this job mostly to get real world experience editing and writing and to learn more about the magazine business and about marketing and public relations. But I was very quickly wrapped up in the outdoor world, living vicariously through numbers of well-known anglers, hunters, and shooters. From interviewing and talking with these people and from hearing and sharing their stories, 
I began to learn more about the industry, and I began to see the truth. I came into contact with so many amazing outdoorsmen and outdoors women who taught me, through example, that the fun isn't always just about the kill or the trophy. It's about the appreciation for and the immersion in this big, beautiful outdoors. It's also about the training, the planning, and the sharpening of skills, as well as the opportunity to really make a difference. Through this, my perspective began to change, and I realized what an important role hunters play in conservation and wildlife management, and that most of them have a true love for Mother Nature and her creatures. I basically realized I had it all wrong, so I decided to go on some hunting and fishing trips with a completely open mind, and I ended up enjoying myself. I also discovered that I really liked shooting and that I was pretty good at it. Being outdoors and interacting with all these wonderful people in the firearms industry helped me rekindle an interest in handguns and in personal protection as well. I took the idea of guns off my mental shelf and began seriously thinking about my skills and my lack thereof, honestly, and also thinking about my role in my future. And instead of continuing along a path of disliking or avoiding those things from the outdoors and firearms world, I began to embrace them and, ultimately, to advocate them. So for all of you who know some antis, if you happen to work with them, interact with them, or even live with them, don't lose hope. Don't write them off as lost causes just yet. And don't be harsh in your comments to or about them. Remember that our lives are affected by a variety of experiences and circumstances, and many anti-hunters or anti-gun people have simply never had the opportunity to experience the world through our eyes. So take a chance. Take someone to the shooting range or open up honest and kind-hearted dialogue so that they can see your point of view. And, you know, you never know what might happen. I'm so blessed that people took the time to honestly share their passions with me. And I'm so grateful that I can now share that same love for this industry in my work and in my own family. So good luck to everybody. I hope that even by living your own life and by staying true and standing strong for the Second Amendment, you can make a difference in the lives of others. Until then, stay safe and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. Fun with headlines. Texas nurses quitting jobs for more money at McDonald's. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. By KXAN web staff, so you know it's good. Oh, uh uh-oh. Some nurses and staff are quitting their jobs at Texas nursing homes for more money working at McDonald's. Advocates say it's a trend that they are seeing statewide, causing a nursing shortage at long-term facilities. The Housing Appropriations Committee has been listening to advocates about the growing problem. Texas has one of the lowest Medicaid reimbursement rates, which makes it difficult for nursing homes and service providers to offer competitive wages. You know, you can start off at McDonald's at $13 to $14 an hour in some cases. You could certainly find easier jobs for more money, and that's a real problem when you're trying to keep good people in your facilities, said Scott Kibb with the Texas Healthcare Association. Many say that the state needs to boost funding and raise the reimbursement rate so that facilities can build up their workforce to prepare to care for the aging population. That just sounds terrible, right? But... Something struck me as being off about those numbers. I did some digging, and I found a website called payscale.com, which allows you to enter a job title and gives you the highest, lowest, and median salary rate for a job in the United States. Now, guess what I found, Sean? I don't know. What did you find? Well, when you think nurse, you think registered nurse, nurse practitioner, or licensed practical nurse, right? Well, when I think of a nurse, I think of RN, you know, got a degree, uh, you know, RN. All right, because the article said nurses were leaving jobs for McDonald's that paid 13 to $14 an hour, which were higher than what they made. According to Payscale, the lowest salary for a nurse practitioner is $35 an hour. Mm-hmm. The lowest salary for a registered nurse is $21 an hour. The lowest salary for an LPN is $14 an hour, 
which is exactly comparable to the highest of the McDonald's wages listed in the article, but the median for an LPN is $18 an hour. So why are they saying that nurses have a lower salary than Mickey D's workers? Well, the pay rate for certified nurse assistants is between $8 and $15 an hour, and those are the ones who are leaving the long-term care facilities. Now, for those who don't know, CNAs, certified nurse assistants, work under the direction of other nurses. Their duties include administer medications or treatments such as catheterizations, suppositories, irrigations, enemas, massages, or douches as directed by a physician or nurse. Clean and sanitize patient rooms, bathrooms, and examination rooms or other patient areas. Document or otherwise report observations of patient behavior, complaints, or physical symptoms to nurses. And apply clean dressings, slings, stockings, or support bandages under direction of nurse or physician. So while I don't wish to denigrate these fine people who do a necessary but unglamorous job, some of it pretty icky. I mean, applying suppositories, doing enemas, cleaning bathrooms. Calling them nurses is like saying the army is losing NCOs, only to discover that what they really don't have enough of is PFCs and corporals. Those are bedpan commandos. But they have nurse in the name, Sean, so clearly they're nurses. Yeah. Sig talked a little bit about batteries last week. He's back again this week to finish up with more about them in... Tech Tips. Tech Tech Tips. Tech tips. Tips. You are damaging my calm. Tech Tips. With Silicon Greybeard. Hey Sig. Last time we left off with some stories about just how weird batteries can behave compared to their ratings. What do you got for me this time? Last time we talked about how the capacity rating doesn't always tell you how the battery behaves. We talked about a nickel hydride battery that when tested at low current had less capacity than an alkaline, but when tested at high current had more. A takeaway lesson here is that this battery might work better than alkalines in something that uses surges of high current. A radio transmitter like your ham radio HT, for example, or an electronic flash. Something that draws a steady low current might not get the best out of these nickel hydride batteries. Where capacity comes in is figuring out how to charge the battery. Think of a battery as a little can full of electrons, like a gas can is a can of gasoline molecules. You take some number of electrons out of the battery while you're using it, and now you have to figure out how many electrons to put back in. The simplest way to charge a NICAD or a nickel hydride is to current limit the charge current to one-tenth of the capacity, leave the charger voltage greater than the battery voltage, and disconnect it after 15 or 16 hours. Don't leave it on the charger. Tons of commercial chargers do just that. But if you don't have a commercial charger for the battery, how do you know which capacity to use? Use the rated capacity, even if it's not exactly right. It's the industry standard. Why leave it for 16 hours when the rate of current is one-tenth of the capacity? Doesn't that say you'll put back all those electrons in 10 hours? Yeah, it does. The extra hours are for things like our example, where the capacity changes with the load being taken and the fact that there's some inefficiency here. NICAD, nickel hydride, and lead chemistries have a tendency to develop increasing internal resistance during use. And if they aren't discharged fairly deeply occasionally, they'll act as though they have much less capacity than they should. There was a notorious incident with NICAD batteries on an early satellite where the batteries developed what was called charge memory. They would only discharge the same amount, I think it was about 20% of the rated, and then they'd behave as if they were dead. Battery makers have maintained that there's no such thing as charge memory since as far back as the 80s. Users have shown, though, that it's better for the batteries to let them go down to different amounts of discharge before recharging them, and use periodic deep discharges to 0.4 volts per cell to recondition them It will greatly extend the battery life. That shouldn't be overdone because it's hard on the battery, but do it occasionally. Lithium polymer is a coverall term that embraces several different chemistries, so lithium batteries are a complex subject on their own. Lithium polymer systems include lithium cobalt, lithium phosphate, lithium manganese. Most so-called lithium polymer packs are for the consumer market are based on lithium cobalt. As far as the user is concerned, lithium polymer is the same as lithium ion. Both systems use identical cathode and anode materials and contain a similar amount of electrolyte. 
Lithium batteries have excellent performance and they're lightweight, but they've developed a reputation for doing some unseemly things like catching fire and burning holes in a shiny new Boeing 787 or two-wheeled hoverboards, so they require a bit more care than a nickel hydride. In smartphones and other appliances with a built-in lithium battery, there's usually a dedicated charger circuit inside it. You plug in a source like the USB 5 volts from your computer or your dedicated charger, and the smart charger IC in the device manages the charging. But there are applications for lithium batteries that don't have a smart chip inside. RC hobbyists use a lot of them, so smart chargers have been developed that are aimed at the hobby market. The show notes include an example smart charger that has separate charging routines for NICAD, nickel hydride, lithium polymer, lithium iron, lithium ion, and lead chemistries, and comes with a handful of connectors and adapters for the common RC model connectors. It'll also run discharge cycles on those batteries at programmed current. I came across a very complete hobby-oriented website with a ton of details on lithium polymer batteries to consider, and that also appears in the show notes. It goes into a, a course on battery terminology and enough details to geek out over for days. Lead batteries should be discharged fairly deeply on occasion and not just always left on the trickle charger. The open circuit voltage on a fully charged lead acid 12-volt battery is close to 12.65 volts. An AGM will be a little bit higher, like 12.8, and a gel cell could be 12.85. If you want to cycle that down to a safe minimum, you can discharge it to 70% of that. 8.8 to 9.0 volts. Deep cycle batteries have their longest life if you don't discharge them less than 70%, but can be discharged down to 50%. How? I have a 35 amp hour AGM battery that I use for emergency backup. To discharge it, I use a 12 volt to 120 volt AC inverter and turn on a 100 watt incandescent light bulb. Since wattage is volts times amps, a 100 watt bulb takes 8 and a third amps from the battery. Add in some for the inverters in efficiency, and that goes to 10 to 10 and a half amps. If I run that an hour, 10 amp hours, I've used up a third of the battery capacity. That inverter is perfect for this use, but it's only going to work on a 12 volt battery. I have a 12 volt fan that draws less than one amp for small 12 volt batteries. For smaller batteries, I use something like that RC hobbyist charger. I could build a load with resistors or build something. Lots of electronic sources and eBay sell spools of LEDs designed to be run from 12 volts. A spool of LEDs might draw something like 3 amps, but could be cut into smaller strips for lower current, and it'll run on less than 12 volts, just not as brightly. Point a fan at them because overheating kills the diodes. I think if you don't have something like one of these chargers and you have storage batteries in your plant, you should consider getting some sort of smart charger. My dream system would handle any chemistry, do a program discharge and a program charge, and not limit the charge or discharge times. I just haven't found one. There's a wealth of information at Battery University and enough depth to allow engineers to design charging systems. If you want your bachelor's in batteries degree, head over there. All right, Sig. It was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. Thanks, Sean. We'll see you then. You can read more from Silicon Greybeard at thesilicongraybeard.blogspot.com. That's Greybeard spelled G-R-A-Y-B-E-A-R-D. Or email questions directly to S-I-Greybeard, one word, at gmail.com. You know, Sean, I bet Sig would give you some pretty good ideas on how to discharge that anchor battery. You know, you're probably right. I should ask him. The J-Block. The Big Three East Spring Media Event. What in the world is this? Well, that's what I was invited to last week and why I wasn't on the podcast. The Big Three East Spring Media event is something that apparently has been going on for years, literally in my backyard, and I had no idea about it. Now, I, I was delighted to be invited to attend this year as a media professional, even though I use the term pretty loosely, and I discovered that it was 45 minutes from my house, and I apparently had driven past it on a regular basis. So I was anxious to go to an event that I could actually reach by car rather than turning it into this entire procedure of budgeting for gas. And the best way to describe it is, well, Oleg said it was like SHOT Show without the drama, but I've never been to SHOT Show. I think it, it was like uh, the NRA annual meeting without the crowds crossed with uh, summer camp for gunnies. 
<laughs> because, okay, we'd get up in the morning and we'd go to the presentation hall and the various uh, manufacturers would get up and they'd do their spiel and they'd, they'd present, they'd give us a sales pitch. They would show us what they were introducing and they'd let us ask questions. And that went on until lunch. And then after lunch, we were set free and we could wander the grounds and we could talk to the people. We could get our grubby little mitts on the product. And if people had cameras, they could take pictures. If they were a film crew, they could film it in action. They could do interviews with the manufacturers. And for someone like myself who really loves to get my hands on things, I got to shoot so many guns using other people's ammo. It was fantastic. Uh, so, like, what did you shoot? Well, I shot all of uh, IWI's new production items coming out. IWI, what is IWI? For those of us who have no idea what IWI is, it's some obscure, nobody's ever heard of it gun company? I think think it's Israeli Weapon Industries. Uh, they're the ones who make the Uzi and the Tavor. Oh, so some little gun company that nobody's ever heard of? Yeah, no one's ever heard of them. Okay. And so they've got a new micro Uzi and uh, the, the Tavor has come out. They've got the second version. It's called the X95. And that was really fun. There are no fewer than three companies who have made multi-caliber systems for the AR-15. And it's going to be interesting to see which one of them snares the market because they've each got their good points and their bad points. One of them is actually made by the guy who used to do Bushmaster. Uh huh. Oh, a company is actually making a production version of the Sturmgewehr 44. Okay. For those who are not entirely <laughs> certain what a Sturmgewehr, what, what number was that? 44? 44. The Sturmgewehr 44 is the first actual assault rifle that was used in war. It was used by the Germans in the tail end of World War II, and it was originally chambered in 8mm Mauser, and they're very hard to get a hold of. But this fellow, and I, I'm blanking on his name or his company's name, but is starting to mass produce them. And so if you really want to get one without having to pay collector's prices, you can buy one. And if you don't want to buy the uh, version in 8mm Mauser, they also are putting them out in 5.56 or 7.62 by 39. So AK? Yeah, so AK and AR chamberings. So, you know, you don't have to break the bank with a boutique round. You can just shoot what you normally have. It's just a gorgeous looking rifle, let me tell you. Mm, pretty cool. And, and then, of course, well, I don't know if everyone has seen the picture, but I got to shoot a saw on full auto. Uh -huh. And see, I was in the army and I never shot a saw on full auto. I believe the technical term is neener, neener, neener. Yeah, well, I <laughs> shot a grease gun once. So. <laughs> uh, so this took place from Wednesday to Friday, and the big closing event was when we had a firing line. And the firing line, I don't quite know how long it was. It was at least 50 yards long, and everyone was there with their weapons of choice, many of them full auto. And... At the very far end, about 100 yards off, there were two cars. They didn't have the explosives inside them, but staged on strategic points, like on top of the tire, uh, on the hood, were bags of binary explosive that were very specifically not Tannerite, because Tannerite is a protected name. And this was a chemical donated by the USA Chemical Company. And the command was given, you know, ready, aim. And, and I'm sitting there, and I've got a suppressed... 308 with a wonderful high power scope and I've got my target but because I'm a proper gunny my finger isn't on the trigger it's in the rest position above and in the fraction of a second it took for my finger to reach the trigger when it was called fire automatic weapons ripped out and the view in my scope was obscured by haze and there were lots of explosions. <laughs> uh, so when all was said and done, and I, I've got a guy next to me who was just mag dumping at full auto, and brass was going over my head, and unburnt powder was going up my nose. By the time our mad minute was done, uh, one of the cars was reduced to a flaming wreck. It burnt down to primer in like no time at all. The second car we couldn't actually set on fire, which was unfortunate. But we discovered something very interesting. Even though we had shot the hell out of it with small arms, none of the bullets actually penetrated to the other side of the engine block. And I thought for sure that given the volume of fire, 
we would have made enough of a failure point that something would have gone through, but nope, nothing had gotten through on the other side. Stuff had skipped over the top and gone through like the hood, but apparently for uh, sustained fully automatic small arms fire, if you hide behind the engine block, you're probably going to be okay, which was interesting. Hmm. And so, you know, any event where hours later I'm digging spent brass out of my pockets and blowing gunpowder of my nose is a great time. I had so much fun at Big Threes. In addition to having fun, I actually got to meet a lot of great people, got to meet manufacturers, got to have lunch with them. So I met them as human beings, not as people who were just trying to sell me something. And I got to meet other people in the industry as well. So anyone who's interested in seeing some of the fun we had, I encourage you to click on the links in the show notes. Big Three East Training Center has a Facebook page and they have a media blog. Lots of people there took lots of great uh, photos, posted them on YouTube, and the blog has collected them. So go take a look and uh, see just a fraction of the fun I had. So thanks, Big Three East. Cool. I saw some of the pictures and it looked like a lot of fun. I think your grin was breaking your face. Oh, yeah. And now a word from our sponsor. You know what will happen. If you ever have to defend yourself, you're going to end up in handcuffs. Are you trained to win the fight after the fight? Sure, you can draw, aim, and put two in the ten ring, but have you learned your legal self-defense? Do you know the law? Go to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash variety to sign up for your legal self-defense class. Each class is tailored to the laws in your state. Attorney Andrew Branca will teach you the law. Not just what the law says, but what the judge's legal opinions say. What the jury instructions say. Sure, you could risk spending the rest of your life in prison because you followed the advice of some gun store counter jockey. Or you could spend the day with the man who literally wrote the book on the law of self-defense. Carry a gun so you're hard to kill. Know the law so you're hard to convict. Go to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash variety to sign up for a legal self-defense class in your state. And make sure to use discount code VARIETY at checkout to receive 10% off. Hey guys, this podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the Donate or Subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. A little help from you is a big help to us. And while we're talking about subscriptions, I'd like to give a big thanks to Eric. Won't give his last name, but Eric, you know who you are. Eric, thanks a lot for your subscription. I talked a bit about the Anti-Gun Podcast two weeks ago, but you knew that Weird wanted to get a shot at it. So now it's his turn in This This Week week in Anti-Gun Nuttery. So hey, Weird, what do you got for me this week? So the first ever gun control podcast is born. What you probably expect is, it sounds like an NPR broadcast, and it's light on facts and high on emotions. What you might not expect is, so far in two months' time, only two 15-minute episodes have been released. Note that Sean has to heavily edit this show from five separate contributors to make a one-hour show every week. And while I don't do the editing-producing parts, if you want to hear my voice alone, I'm part of three hours of podcasts every week, most weeks. And we have jobs besides doing this stuff. Let's dive right into her first episode, which is an introduction. In this series, I hope to tackle a problem maybe many of you are struggling with, if you're anything like me. What is up with all the guns in this country? It's not a question I've had to deal with much in my life. But then I moved my family back to Ohio after having been away for a long, long time. And I don't know if it's the time or the place, but suddenly I can't get away from it. Well, to be snide, I bet none of us listening to this show have been concerned about this at all. Of course, like most anti-gun politics, it seems to be driven by selection bias. So this clip will be a bit of a character reference and give you an idea of the level of smug to be expected in this podcast. But New England and I, we didn't mix. When my older daughter was a baby, we went to a Mommy and Me music playgroup. The leader said, any requests? Naturally, I said, Freebird. I mean, I rushed to say Freebird before anybody else could. No need for that. Believe it or not, I only got one laugh, and that from a woman who'd grown up in Michigan. I guess it's a Midwestern thing. I'm sorry. I grew up in Maine, and I heard the Freebird joke before I'd even heard the Skinnerd song. 
I was even once asked to be that guy at a show where my friend was performing. See, they had a great Freebird cover, but what's the fun of playing it if you don't have some jerk in the audience yelling, Freebird! I got a great laugh and a surprise from the audience when the band did indeed play some Skinnerd. Either her delivery was terrible, or this was a really stuffy mommy group. I've listened to her podcasts, and I've been to a bunch of mommy groups. Either one is really plausible. Still, claiming that being from the Midwest has anything to do about knowing the songs from a band from Florida just sounds really ignorant. I was aware that my home state had a sort of Wild West reputation, but that was just because New Englanders typically could not tell you where Ohio ended and Iowa began. Screw you, Iowa! Or something. And where Ohio ends and Iowa begins? Um, honey, Ohio and Iowa don't touch at all. There's the states of Indiana and Illinois in the middle. Also, I've never considered or known anybody who considers Ohio as the Wild West. Further, not only does she toss Iowa under the bus, but she also tosses half of New England under there too. Yeah, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island are anti-gun states, but Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire are some of the most gun-friendly states with next to no violent crime. But Ohioans weren't what you'd call gun nuts or anything. This wasn't Texas, after all. No, Ohio has better gun laws. Not that she has any idea what the laws are like between the two states. I was shocked also to find out that my state permitted people to walk around with concealed firearms on their person. I know, I've lived a sheltered life. But perhaps most disturbing of all, our new house turned out to be just around the corner from a gun store an actual store that sold actual guns. Right there in broad daylight, you could buy a gun. The icing on the cake for me was its name, Gun Envy. So much ignorance. So first up, she used to live in Northampton, Mass., which as far as the chief of police there is concerned is a shall-issue town. If you can pass a background check and take an NRA basic pistol class, you get a carry permit. Most likely, if you're 21 plus and you want to buy a gun, you will essentially need to get a carry permit first to do so. And why is it anti-gunners get so bent out of shape when talking about gun shops? This shop is Gun Envy of Columbus, Ohio. Check out the show notes. They seem to be a pretty cool shop. Gun shops are the place where everybody has to pass a background check to buy a gun. And Gun Envy offers a wide range of training and safety courses. This should be a hint on gun control. You pass universal background checks, you need to go to a gun shop to transfer a gun. And you can't do it in this town because gun stores are yucky. Also, operating in broad daylight kind of is just a code word for normal business hours. Now, I could have understood a gun store in, you know, River Sticks or Rittman, one of those places where they sell the Velvet Elvis paintings by the side of the road. She really wants to have a discussion about guns across the political spectrum. Why won't you dumb booger eaters support my common sense gun control? Isn't she a charmer? Although I had lived before in Houston and Washington, D.C., the only person I'd ever known to pack heat was in fact a cop. And he sure didn't go around talking about it. Yeah, except you lived in a shall-issue town. While Northampton isn't on the list, a local news station took police data and compiled a list of the most armed per capita towns in Massachusetts. And neighboring East Hampton is number 42 with 6% of the population with an unrestricted firearms permit. You wonder why nobody talked about it. You just noted that people who simply shop at a gun store, let alone get a carry permit, are the type of folks who enjoy velvet Elvis paintings. I suspect the reason the only person you knew who had a gun was a cop, because like most anti-gun jerks, you probably asked him the moment you knew he was a cop if he was packing heat. And he was rightfully uncomfortable with your clownish behavior. I have a bunch more to talk about from this show, but I'll have to save it for another week. All right, Weird. It was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. See you next week, Sean. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world dot com. So I only have one question about this entire anti-gun podcast thing. Mm Mm-hmm. When did Daria get her own podcast? <laughs> I I thought she went off the air in 2002. I caught that reference. I used to love Daria, the TV show. I thought that was awesome. It's like a cross between Daria and Valley Girl. You, you remember the old Valley Girl? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right there in broad daylight. Like, gag me with a spoon. Exactly. If Daria 
<laughs> did Valley Girl with <laughs> without the accent, but just the cadence, like right there in broad the daylight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what's funny is I've corresponded with this woman. She's you know it should it should be interesting. Should be interesting. Stuff that grinds my gears. Well, Aaron, since you're the guest, why don't you give it a start? Oh, do I have to do this? Yeah, come on, Aaron. It's a, it's a regular segment of the show. Okay. People. People are grinding my gears. Uh, that's kind of vague there, Aaron. People on Facebook. Is this about that transgender bathroom bill? No, for the guest, you're going to have to go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <sighs> yes. Yes. Same. Same here. <sighs> you would think that there is no possible way for people to see the other person's point of view on this. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Either we're all transphobic bigots or we are all enabling sexual predators. Yeah, pretty much. That's really the only two options. Yeah. Because, you know, it's not possible for anybody to be doing anything but arguing in bad faith because that's all I ever hear. You're, you know, obviously I am arguing in bad faith because naturally, if I think that opening the door to anybody who wants to walk in, because that's basically what the Charlotte law change did, the Charlotte changed the code by saying it was illegal to discriminate against anybody by saying you couldn't come into the bathroom that wasn't yours. You know, it was now illegal and not just in public property, but like on private property that there would be some negative problems that would happen from this. Oh, why are you calling trans people child molesters? Um, where the f- where did that come from? Cuz I think I know one or two trans people and last I checked, I <laughs> uh, didn't think they were child molesters or I wouldn't associate with them. Uh, yeah. I don't know. But then I don't like, you know, uh, what's that? What's the dumbest argument against racism? Well, I've got black friends. So it's never an argument I make. Well, I've got a trans friend. That's, you know, that's his dorky argument. So I never make it. But I always feel like <sighs> a few people knew. Shut up. Oh, you just hate trans people. Yes. In fact, yes, I do. That is the reason. Um, okay, so full disclosure for the however many people who aren't familiar. Yes, the three people who listen to this podcast and don't know. Um, hi everybody, I'm trans. I try not to make a big deal out of it, but occasionally it does come up. Uh, Sean has met me. Sean has not run screaming from my presence, so apparently I passed the smell test and I'm okay. Right, and if you really want to know how that I know, go back and listen to the NRA show. Remember the NRA show? Get your hand off my thigh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we were using one microphone in the room and Adam and Aaron and I were all sitting right next to each other in the media room. So, yes, I've met Aaron. Yeah. So, but again, uh, not a deal. We've known each other for a long time. Yeah. So this affects you directly. A, well, to a certain extent. I mean, it's it's definitely within my wheelhouse and... Okay, in terms of affecting me directly, well, mm, see, I'm the kind of person who, like with with shower rooms and lockers, I don't like changing in front of anyone, period. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, I I wouldn't want to go into either one. I would prefer my own place to change. And it's kind of like that with bathrooms, too. Um, With me, what I would do is, if I needed to use the facilities... I would use the facilities for whichever one I looked like so as not to cause a problem. If I currently have looking my best and I'm, I'm passing as a woman, I'm going to use the ladies' room because it would look really, really strange if a woman in a dress walked into a men's room. And if I'm looking schlubby and haven't taken care of myself, I'm not going to stroll into the women's room wearing uh, sweats and a t-shirt and stubble because that's crass <laughs> so you know i think if most people first of all did the whole don't be douches to one another that would solve a lot of problem secondly people are confusing the whole changing room and dressing room where people get naked in front of other people with bathrooms where people go into stalls and do their business and uh, the final problem is everyone's worried about what's going to happen to women and little girls. 
And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be concerned about women and little girls being preyed upon. But you know what's being completely glossed over in this whole thing? <laughs> that, that, that you can have male sexual predators in the men's room preying on little boys. Right, and I heard one that just made me go, oh dear, I forgot about that. What about the woman in the men's room? Do you really want that? Do you really want to be the guy who walks in on a woman in the men's room who can then say whatever she wants to the police and is going to be believed because, oh, women never lie about that. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, that gave me the creeps. Because what am I going to do? I'm going to walk in. There's one now. I'm walking straight right the heck back out. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not going to be that guy. Bye. See ya. I'll go pee in a bush first. Because... Yeah, no, uh uh-uh. It's it's a personal rule. I'm never in a place alone with a woman that I am not comfortable enough with to know that she would never pull a stunt like that with me. Yeah, so I I guess the point that I want to say to our listeners is that when trans people use the bathroom, all we want to do is use the toilet. We don't want to molest you. We don't want to be molested. And we want to fit in. If you see the archetypical boogeyman, which is now the large, muscular, bearded man in a dress, I'm not going to say with 100% certainty, but I'm going to say with a very high confidence that he's not trans. (laughs) Um, He's just trying to pretend to be one. Trans people want to fit in. We don't want to stick out. And we just want to use the bathroom in peace. But then, see, that's not what the argument ever was. The argument wasn't that somebody like you was the problem. The argument was, if you can't, as a woman, say, you are a man, you don't belong here, get out, to the men who will inevitably walk in, then what will happen is, the men who want to walk in will walk in, and you can't kick them out. The first thing is, is that, yes, you will be able to use whatever bathroom you like. Yay, great. That's good. We're happy with that. The step two is, is the creeps will not be able to be pushed out. And step three is the ladies will stop being able to use bathrooms in public. They will have to go home. Yeah. So so the problem isn't trans people using the bathroom. The problem is creeps who have always been creeps and who have always been doing this sort of thing anyway. Now they're going to try and claim some sort of protection. I don't really the law broke more things than it fixed and it's it's just a mess. I mean <sighs> But my problem Your problem wasn't the law though. Your problem was the jerks. It's it's the way people are reacting over it and I'm just I've I've reached my limit. At this point, anytime I see people talking about transgender or bathroom or posting one of the pictures, I just hide notification. I can't deal with it anymore. Yeah, I understand. (sighs) I am really rapidly reaching my limit of being called a bigot because, you know what? Screw you guys. I'm tired of this bull. I I have reached my limit of being called mentally ill. Yeah, I understand. Which is another rant, which is not really (laughs) suitable for now, but at some point I should probably have it. Well, yeah. But, you know, we like guns, so that makes us evil, rotten, nasty killers, doesn't it? Yeah. I can be hated by both sides. Well, that's our show for the week. Thanks again to Rob Allen for her music. And Firearms Policy Coalition for their support. And thank you for listening to the Gunblog Variety Cast. Constructive criticism can be sent to Sean at SeanSorrentino.com. And hate mail to WizardPC at GunsCarsTech.com. If you're not already subscribed, subscribe in iTunes for all you Apple users. Or in a Podcatcher app or Stitcher Radio if you're an Android user. And make sure to help us grow by sharing this podcast with your friends. Show notes can be found at GunBlogVarietyCast.com forward slash episode 87.
This is a URS production.